The Prophet وسلم, and the companions, they greatly suffered, especially when they were living in Mecca. One of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would ease the hearts of the believers, it would be sharing with them stories of different people that were tested before, of a people that will go through trials and calamities, and how they either succeeded in this life or in the hereafter. We know that from the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to granting the believers victory, you have three ways of it actually happening. One of the ways is that the believers do not actually get to taste victory while they're in this life. So they'll only be able to actually get victory in the hereafter. Meaning that while they're in this world, they continue to suffer. And that's all you see from it in the dunya. But when it comes to the akhirah, and this is the greatest victory that a people could be given, they're going to be from those that are given that victory. Another way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants the believers victory is that He actually allows them to taste victory in this life, where they see the fruits of their struggle, where they actually see this ayah being implemented right away where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ma'al usri yusra. That indeed, whenever there is difficulty, right with it. Ma'a here actually means when that difficulty is coming, right with it, that ease is there with it. So sometimes the believers actually get to see this victory materialize right in front of their eyes. And the other way is that they don't get to see this victory. Not only do they not get to see it here in this life, but it also becomes more difficult for those that come after. But then eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised the believers that in the hereafter, all victory belongs to them. One of these stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares for the companions, for them to be able to bear the suffering that they were enduring in Mecca, it is a story that we find in Surah Al-Buruj, the story that is known as the story of the people of the ditch. In this story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us what true victory really is and the difficulty that a person needs to go through before they reach that victory that is waiting for them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he explains the story and he says that there was once a king who ruled over the people and he made the people worship him. From the greatest of crimes that a person could commit is that they call themselves God and they make the people worship them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that the magician that this king had that would do magic for him, he began getting old and he began to tire and he was unable to perform the tricks that he used to do or perform the magic that he used to be able to do. So he tells the king that I need you to find me a successor, somebody that I can teach now in this old age of mine so that he can become your new magician. So the king, he goes, he sends his men out and they go and they try to find a boy that can learn from this magician. There's a young boy that is chosen. This young boy, he goes to the lessons of the magician. But in his heart, he's not satisfied with what he is learning. What ends up happening one day on his way to these lessons, he runs into a monk and the monk tells him, come with me and I am going to teach you. So he goes to the monk and the monk begins teaching him La ilaha illallah and he begins teaching him about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was at the time something that the people had almost completely lost. They were worshipping this king and they had no idea about La ilaha illallah. So now, the boy continues to study with this monk, but then one day he goes late to the magician. The magician gets angry at him and he begins to beat him. He tells him, I never want to see you be late to these lessons of ours ever again. The boy, he goes to the monk and he complains. He says, the magician began beating me because I was late. How can I continue to come to you and go to him? So the monk tells him that what you should do every time that you go to the magician, you should look at him and tell him, my family kept me busy, that's why I'm late. And every time you go to your family, you tell them, the reason why I'm late, the magician kept me busy. And let this go on until you master this La ilaha illallah and it becomes ingrained inside of your heart. So the boy takes this advice of the monk and he begins to go to his lessons and Iman continues to increase in him. Eventually one day, he's on the road and he sees a beast emerge. And this beast begins to terrorize the people. The people have no response to this beast. The boy decides, it is time for me to put to test the Iman that has been instilled with me by this monk. I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show me who is upon the right path. Is it the magician that I am going to or is it the monk? So he decides to pick up a rock and he says, Oh Allah, if the Iman of the monk is more beloved to you than the Iman of the magician, let this rock destroy this beast and he throws it and the beast becomes defeated. That he goes to the monk after this and he tells him what happened. And here the monk tells him 
about the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the believers, how they are going to be treated in this dunya. He tells him, today you have surpassed me in iman. You have reached a level that I have not reached. Because of this, there are people that are going to come to you and they are going to test you in your iman. When that happens, do not tell them about me. Do not expose me to these people. Because whenever we look at the life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, there are always two sides. The side of iman, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it so that they are going to be tested from every angle, whether it is from their children, whether it is from their society, or even from their own selves, calamities are going to come upon them. So he tells them that do not let them know that I taught you these things. Soon, the news of this boy spreads throughout the town. Every single person that has a need goes to him and he says, can you cure me from this? Can you help me with this? To the point where through the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's able to cure the people that are blind and he's able to cure those that have leprosy, those that people would not even dare go next to, he begins curing them through the dua of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now one day, one of the men that used to sit around the king who was blind, he hears about this boy. He decides that I have to go to him. He goes to this young boy and he asks him, I hear that you cure the people that are blind, you return their eyesight. Can you return my eyesight? And the boy tells him that I am not able to return your eyesight, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. All you have to do is believe in Allah, say la ilaha illallah, and then afterwards make dua to him and your eyesight will return. This man that used to be around the king that used to claim that he was Lord, he understood in this moment that he has to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, La ilaha illallah. And then he makes dua that Allah returns his eyesight. He goes back to the gatherings of the king. And the king realizes that this man that was just blind has come back to this gathering with his eyesight fully restored. So he tells him, who has given you your eyesight back? And the man responds, my Lord returned it back to me. This king in his kibir, in his arrogance, in his pride, he says, do you have a Lord besides me? Have I given you permission to have a Lord other than me? And he responds to him and he says, Allahu Rabbi wa Rabbuk, that Allah is my Lord and he's also your Lord. And at this moment, the king tells him, where did you come with this idea of there's another Lord with me? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And from this moment, the torture of this man begins. He resists him as long as he could. The punishment that is being given to him, he endures it. He tries to remain patient. Then finally he says, there's a boy that I went to who told me about Allah and I believed in him and I made dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returned it. So the king says, go and fetch that boy. Go and bring that boy to me. The boy is brought to the king and the king begins to question him. Do you have a Lord other than me? Have I given you permission to worship another Lord besides me? And the boy responds to him, I worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. So the king says, if you do not return from this religion, if you don't turn back to the ways of your people, if you don't stop this transgression and return to us and continue to worship me, you're not going to be able to live. So he threatens him with, I'm going to kill you. The boy says, you're not going to be able to kill me. So the king tells his men, what I want you to do is take this boy on top of a mountain. When you get to the mountain, give him the choice of remaining on La ilaha illallah or being thrown off of the cliff. If he refuses, throw him off of the mountain. So now the boy is taken with the men and when they get to the mountain top, he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, Ya Allah, deal with them as you see fit. Do with them what you wish. So he's given the choice. Do you want to remain on La ilaha illallah or do you want to go back to your religion and the religion of your people? He says, I will remain on La ilaha illallah. And at the moment that he utters these words, the mountain begins to shake. All of the men that came with him perish except him. And he goes and he walks back to the king. And he tells the king, I told you that you are not going to be able to kill me. And the king says to him, if I'm unable to kill you, I will show you the second time that I am able to. You might have been saved the first time, but not this time. So he tells another group of men, I want you to take him to the middle of the ocean. Take him on the water. And while he is there, give him the choice of returning to La ilaha illallah or leaving. And when he is there, give him the choice of returning back to his religion. If he does not return, throw him off the boat. So he's taken. And the moment comes when he's finally in the middle of the ocean. He's on the boat. 
and he makes the same dua that he made on that mountain peak. And he says, Ya Allah, deal with them as you see fit. Do with them, protect me from them as you see fit. So he's given the option. Are you going to return to the ways of your parents? Are you going to return to the ways of your people? Or are you going to be on this path that you have chosen that is different than the path of your people? You have forsaken your Lord, the King, and you've taken another as a Lord. What are you going to do? And he says, I am going to stick to La ilaha illallah. And then they begin to try to throw him off of the boat. The next thing you know, the men that came with him are the ones that fall off and he's able to walk back to the king again. He says, you are not going to be able to kill me. But if you desire to kill me, I can tell you what you have to do to kill me. So the king says, tell me what I can do so that this headache, this nuisance that you are bringing me can be finished. He says, if you want to kill me, you must gather the people. And once you gather the people, you must tie me to a tree and say, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, Allahu Akbar, or Bismillah, in the name of Allah, the Lord of this boy, and then shoot the arrow. And once the arrow is shot, if you say these, you're going to be able to kill me. So the king comes and he gathers the people. And once the people are gathered, he ties him to the tree. Once he ties him to the tree, he begins to shoot him without saying what he was commanded to say. And the boy tells him, I know why you weren't unable to kill me. Because you did not say in the name of Allah, the Lord of this boy. Once you say that, that's when you're going to be able to kill me. So the king finally and the people are gathered and they are hearing what he is saying. He says the third time after missing the first two times, he says, Bismillah. He says, in the name of Allah, the Lord of this boy. And he shoots the arrow and this arrow kills the boy. Now afterwards, all you hear from amongst the people, every single one of them is saying, we believe in Allah, the Lord of this boy. A man from the followers of the king comes to him and says, what you feared has come true. What you tried to prevent now has been fulfilled. The difficulty that you tried to bring to this child, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought ease for him. So what does he do? In this moment, instead of realizing the haqq that this boy was on and the falsehood that he had, he says, begin digging the ditches. And the roads are just turned into ditches everywhere. After they're dug, he says, Al-Nari al wuqud Allah describes it and he says, they begin to light these ditches up. They begin to light them. Now they're filled with fire. And he says to everybody, anyone that believes in La ilaha illallah needs to be thrown in and give everybody the option of returning to their ways. And one by one, the people throw themselves in. At this moment, if you and I were to look at this story and see the amount of believers that are going to be killed, we would say that subhanAllah, how sad of a story this is. Innocent lies being killed as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا أَن يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ Their crime was nothing except the fact that they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the one that deserves praise and who is the one that is almighty and capable. Their crime was this of La ilaha illallah and they went one by one. You and I would look at it and say these believers were tested and they did not get victory because we did not see it. We see them passing away. One by one they're jumping into the fire. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he concludes the story and he says that a mother comes with her child and she begins to resist because of this child that is with her. She doesn't want to go into the fire. Then this child that is not able to speak says to his mother, اصبري يا أمه فإنك على الحق He says, oh my mother, be patient because you are upon the truth. And the mother and the child, they both go into the ditch. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, when he tells us about the story, he tells us at the end of it, وَذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْكَبِيرُ this is the great victory that they were given. You and I, if we look at this story, what victory was there? The king still continued to live. The believers passed away. The oppressor was still there and the oppressed were no longer there. But to them, a day is going to come where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them in the surah right after this. He says, Inna batsha rabbika lashadeed. That indeed, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath and his anger, it is very extreme. So when it actually comes, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to punish, there's not going to be anyone that is going to be saved. So my brothers and sisters in this beautiful story, the companions were able to see that even though they were going through difficulties, even though they were unable to practice their Islam, just like in that story, either they are going to be given Jannah or they're going to be given ease in this dunya. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those people that understand the victory that the greatest victory is the one that is going to come in the hereafter. This dunya has no bearing on the type of victory that you and I are going to have.
وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين